Hey guys, so we're on chapter 18.1 and 18.2 of your textbook, and if you're on my website, I think we're on chapter 9, but we could be on chapter 10. So we'll be talking about the heart and cardiac muscle properties. So let's start. So your heart has a mass of 250 to 350 grams, and it's in the mediastinum, which is basically the central cavity of your thorax, and it has a double-walled covering called the pericardium, and it's made up of uh, and the two walls are the fibrous pericardium and the serous pericardium. And that can be divided into your, um, your serous pericardium can be divided into your uh, visceral and parietal pericardium. And in between the visceral and parietal pericardium is a cavity called the pari um, pericardial cavity. And in that cavity there is serous fluid which allows your heart to pump in a fr friction-free environment. And there are two other layers in your heart wall, and those are the myocardium and the endocardium. And your myocardium is basically the muscular portion, and it makes up the bulk of your heart wall. And then your endocardium is basically um, endothelium, and it actually um, extends out into the endothelium of your blood vessels as well. <clears throat> So I just want to, I also want to mention that your myocardium has a connective tissue uh, skeleton, I guess you can say, in it. Um, it's called the fibrous, connect, uh, fibrous skeleton of your heart. And so here's a little heart chunk, and if you take a look at this, um, it, there's the fibrous layer on the superficial portion, and deep to the fibrous layer there's your serous um, pericardium. So your, there's your parietal and visceral pericardium, and I want to mention that your parietal and visceral pericardium connect. So if the if I were to extend this out into the whole heart, so your parietal pericardium would go down this way, it would go down, uh, around, it'll go up, and then after that it'll go back down, and from when it goes back down it'll connect to the heart wall, and that will be your visceral pericardium, which I also want to mention is also called your um, epicardium. And it'll go back up, and it'll go back up, and then after that it'll go back up to the outside where it becomes the parietal pericardium again. And there's your pericardial cavity with serous fluid in there. And then here's your myocardium. And as I said before, it makes up the bulk of it. And there's um, connective tissue, fibrous connective tissue surrounding it as well. And in here, there's your endocardium. And that's basically like endothelium, as I said before. So let's talk about the chambers and great vessels in, um, in your heart. So there are four chambers of your heart. There are two atria and two ventricles. And they're both divided by something called the septum. So the interventricular septum, and it's inter, not inner, like it says in this presentation. The interventricular septum divides the right and left ventricles, is the part of the septum that divides the right and left ventricles. And the interatrial septum is the part of the septum that divides the right atria and the left atrium. So. Let's talk about your atria. So they have things called auricles on their surface. They're basically kind of like appendages. But besides that, they don't really have much on their surface. And they have pectinate muscles. And pectinate muscles are just basically muscles inside the um, atrium. And they also have a little crest called the crista terminalis, which divides the f um, anterior and posterior portion of your heart. And there's also a little depression on your interatrial um, interatrial septum called the fossa ovalis and that actually sprung from what used to be a hole in that area called the foramen oval. So um, they, they contract but they contract very weakly. Um, and the superior and inferior vena cava and the great cardiac vein feed the right atrium. And then the pulmonary veins feed the left atrium. <coughs> now let's talk about ventricles. They make mo up most of the volume of your heart so your um, Left or right ventricle will make up most of the anterior portion. Your left ventricle will make up, m up most of the in postero inferior portion of your heart. Um, they have trabeculi carni carnii and papillary muscles. So trabeculi carnii are basically the muscles in your ventricles, and they're they're actually rigid inside the heart. And um, the papillary muscles are involved with valve function, function, and we'll be talking about valves in a moment. And your right ventricle pumps to the pulmonary trunk, and your left ventricle pumps to the aorta. So let's take a look at this. So um, your right, so as I said before, your right ventricle pumps to the pulmonary trunk or pulmonary artery in this case, and then your left ventricle will pump into the, your aorta, which is this loopy artery, I guess. It makes a loop. And 
um, your inferior and, or, well, no, inferior and superior vena cava um, feed the right atrium and your, and it goes in here. And the um, pulmonary veins, there are four of them, two here and two here, feed your um, right atrium, or left atrium, left atrium. And also, I want to mention that if this was, so if we had a picture like this, there would be a vein going this way called the great cardiac vein, and that would actually feed into the right atrium as well. <clears throat> so moving on, we're going to discuss blood flow through the heart and coronary circulation. Blood flow is made up of two circuits or circulations, and those are the pulmonary and the systemic circuits. So the pul pulmonary uh, comes from the word pulmonose, which means lungs. And it's in the right side, and your right heart, the right side of your heart is responsible for it. It sends deoxygenated blood to the lungs. So it goes from your right atrium to your right ventricle to the pulmonary artery to the lungs to your pulmonary veins. We'll see this in the picture below. And then systemic circulation is in the, is in the left heart and left side of the heart, and it sends blood to the rest of the body and then back into the pulmonary, um, superior and inferior vena cava, where um, it goes to the right atrium where pulmonary circulation starts again. So, in, and now we're going to talk about coronary circulation. So just like your tissue needs oxygen, so does your heart. So there are veins and arteries on your heart called coronary veins and, or cardiac veins and coronary arteries. And so there are two main coronary arteries. There's the right and left coronary arteries. They also have a bunch of branches as well, like the circumflex artery and the um, anterior intraventricular artery. But, um, We'll just see these in the pictures. I won't really discuss them much. And then there are three main coronary, or it should say cardiac, cardiac veins, the great, middle, and small cardiac veins. And there are also anterior cardiac veins, but um, they're, um, I won't really talk about them as much either. So here's the blood flow in the heart. So starting off with pulmonary circulation, you start off, excuse me, in your right atrium, and it goes to your right ventricle, to the pulmonary artery, and to the lungs, and then it'll go from the lungs once oxygen exchange occurs. It'll go back into the pulmonary veins and into the um, left atrium. And yes, the um, pulmonary vein, so the pulmonary artery and pulmonary veins are opposite in this case, because you usually think arteries send oxygenated blood, but in this case, the pulmonary artery sends deoxygenated blood and the pulmonary veins send ox oxygenated blood. Um, but anyway, moving on. So then here's the left ventricle, and then um, from the pul and from the left artery uh, atrium, the systemic circulation starts. So left artery, left ventricle, from the into then there's the aorta to the rest of the body. <clears throat> now let's talk about coronary circulation. So here's your left or your right coronary artery and your left coronary artery. So they, as I said before, they have a bunch of branches. So here's your anterior interventricular artery, then the posterior interventricular artery, then the circumflex artery right here, then the marginal artery. Um, those um, are the branches of your right and left um, coronary arteries. And I want to mention that there's a much of anatomical variability when it comes to coronary arteries because, I mean, sometimes only one coronary artery supports the whole heart. Sometimes it can be different. There's a bunch of anatomical variability. It just depends on the person. And I want to also want to mention that there the branches are called, um, or connections are called anastomoses. Anyway, so going to um, cardiac veins, here's the great cardiac vein right here, and it feeds into the right atrium. And then there's the middle cardiac vein here, and the small cardiac vein. These will eventually feed into the great cardiac vein, which feeds into the right atrium. So valves, there are two types, semilunar and atrioventricular. So the semilunar are um, in between the ventricle and the great vessels, and atrioventricular are in between the atrium and the ventricles. So um, there are two atrioventricular, the tricuspid and the bicuspid, which is also more commonly called the mitral valve. I don't know why, but apparently it looks like a bishop's hat, a bishop's mitre, but I can't really see it. And then after that, there's the semilunar or pulmonary, uh, the semilunar valves, which are the pulmonary and aortic. So the atrioventricular valves have chordae tendini that connect to papillary muscles, and that's why papillary muscles are involved with valve function. 
and we'll discuss how they work later. And um, there's also semilunar valves, um, and we'll discuss how they work now. So right here you have your tricuspid valve, and your mitri mitral valve, which are the atrioventricular valves. So here's the papillary muscle, and then you see these little cord things. Those are the chordae tendini. And what happens is when your heart contracts, that will push the, um, pull the valve upward. But if these chordae tendini weren't there, they would go all the way up, and blood will flow back. So the chordae tendini makes sure, makes sure it doesn't go all the way up. It, makes sure it doesn't go too far. It'll, and it makes sure that it'll stay in closed position when it's contracting. And then the semilunar valves, when the heart contracts, blood will flow upward, and that will open the valve. But then after that, when it relaxes, the blood will want to flow back. But the pulmonary valve, um, but the blood flow back will close the pulmonary valve, or, or the semilunar valves. And that's pretty much it for valve function. Now, cardiac muscle properties. They are striated, which means they have myofibrils and um, sarcomeres. They're branched, so um, unlike skeletal muscle, which is just like one little tube, they actually have branches. And they actually have something called intercalated discs. So they're basically junctions, they're, um, but they have desmosomes and gap junctions, which allow for, um, so when an action potential occurs, it allows, those intercalated discs actually allow it um, all of the cells to contract at the same time. And that's what makes it function as one system or makes it function what is as a functional syncytium. And they have one or two central nuclei. Um, contra they contract by the sli sliding filament model. And if you don't know what that is, check the muscle chapter again. And if they, and they also have loose seat connective tissue, a loose connective tissue matrix that is connected to the fibrous skeleton. Um, their properties are automaticity or autorhythmicity. Some cardiac muscle cells can actually generate their own action potentials. And then there's also um, another property is that all cells attached to a motor unit, but not necessarily all motor units, contract or depolarize at the same time. And it also has a longer refractory period, so it can prevent um, tetanus and stuff like that. Um, it has a bunch of mitochondria because your heart has been pumping forever. Well, not, uh, I'm exaggerating, but it's been pumping for a long time. And so it uses up a lot of energy. And it's mainly aerobic energy. Um, sometimes it can use lactic, um, um, lactic acid or uh, anaerobic energy, but um, you can't power your whole heart with just anaerobic energy. It usually, it needs to have aerobic energy. So let's take a look at this picture. So here is a microscopic anatomy of a heart muscle. So this is an intercalated disc right here. And then, as I said before, instead of being one tube, it branches off like so. And it has a centrally lo located nuclei, one or two. In this case, it looks like two, but I'm not quite sure. And um, <coughs> yeah, it has gap junctions and desmosomes. And if you don't know what those are, you have to go way back into chapter three. And um, yeah, it has sarcomeres, um, uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, but what it doesn't have is terminal cisternae, which means it only has T-tubules. Um, so depolarization only occurs in T-tubules. And it contracts basically the same way that a skeletal muscle would. Anyway, that's pretty much it, so thanks for watching. Um, I hope you liked it, and I'm sorry that this was really long. Anyway, I'm done now, so bye.